Welcome to the Aerostrategic Investor Presentation. Throughout this credit presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll, and I'm sure the company will be most grateful for your participation. I'd now like to play a short video produced by the company. Welcome to Delta, Millard County, Utah. Population 3,724. Home to the Lost Sheep Mine and the Floor Spar Plant, both owned and operated by Ares Strategic Mining. Ares, once a junior mining company, is now on the cusp of becoming a manufacturing company is still the only permitted floor spar mine in the U.S., with their sights firmly set on being the leading floor spar producer for the nation. 2023 was a pivotal year for Ares, and much progress was made, especially in regards to funding. This made significant progress on both mine and plant construction possible. Ares is pleased to report that the first half of 2024 has been extremely successful. So what does that progress look like? And what does the rest of 2024 hold for Ares? Outside, just outside this building here, we have the process site. Um, obviously, things are being built there very quickly. Um, we're going to get some rudimentary equipment going so we can put some initial product through it. And once that's fully operational, we'll have that fully ramped up um, modern industrial manufacturing process going here at, uh, in Delta. Uh, we started on site in February of 2024. We did the site setup and from there on we started the development of the ramp, which the intent of it is to get us to the ore body. Uh, we are around 120 feet away from reaching the mineralization, the floor spar mineralization. We're supported by an amazing team that we have on site. We have a support of James Walker himself and the entire Ares team, and we look forward to a producing mine. From our point of view at Ares, the progress has been very rapid, very professional. The site looks fantastic, <clears throat> and we really are weeks away from the big ore body now. Only in a few more weeks, we can report back that we've hit it. And then once we get to that stage, ventilation will go in and then we can start pulling out industrial quantities of floor spar and the fact that it's going to be the only floor spar producing operation in the country. Hi, my name is Steve Thomas, Provo Mining. I'm the mine manager at the Lost Sheep Mine and uh, I've been managing the program since probably about uh, beginning of February when we first got there. There was a lot of stuff to do on the surface to get us where we are today. Um, from moving of an existing mill to dealing with BLM, MSHA regulations, and everything to get everything up to where we are today. Like, uh, we had three employees to start with, and now we're up to probably 20. We have great workforce, great miners out there that work very hard and do a very good job at the uh, their job and without them, I don't know where we'd be, but it wouldn't uh, be where we are today. Hi, I'm Nathan Child. I am a geologist for Area Strategic Mining and I have been on this project since 2020 uh, through various drill programs and a lot of exploration. I have walked all of those mountains of all of our property. Um, so this is an example of some of the core drilling that we have done very recently. You can see that we get into a lot of the really high grade through here. It's the very dark purple. Um, you know, you can kind of see how the rock changes as you go along. Uh, this is going, so where we started would have been ground zero, right? Right at the surface. Um, and then we're just making our way deeper and deeper and deeper. So. Uh, this is a bunch of the high grade here. This is actually a really good run of high grade. Uh, you know, let's see, this started uh, two, where is that? 237, uh, it goes all the way up. 
you know, 290-ish. I mean, you got a 63-foot run of high grade right there. So that's what we're going after in this program. I think a lot of shareholders have already heard me repeat very often that floor spar is very ubiquitously used in industry. So steel, aluminum, hydrofluoric acid, fluorine. <clears throat> but there are other resurgent industries occurring at the moment that floor spar supports enormously. So say for instance, there's a lot of resurgent interest in nuclear energy that's, that's happening in the States at the moment. And the Department of Energy is pouring a lot of money into that. So in order to be able to enrich uranium, um, and you need it in the form of uranium hexafluoride. But to create that product, you actually need um, hydrofluoric acid. So suddenly there is a domestic supply of acid spar, which is the material that's directly used in the manufacture of hydrofluoric acid, which then allows you to enrich that uranium, to give you that nuclear power. So you can't have one industry without the other. And you know, that's something that floor spar brings to the table. We are still looking for additional financing to put into this. Like, as you can imagine, building a mine can be expensive, especially when you've got a full crews working three shifts, um, even overnight, just to get us into that ore body. Um, it's a, it, but it's, it should be very attractive to any investor. It's immediately free trading stock under the life exemption. It's at 18 cents with a full warrant at 26. Um, so it should, it should have massive appeal. And also, once we close this financing and we're getting um, very, very close to manufacturing, we can expect, uh, we, we would expect a, an equal market response that is as positive as the developments here. And the good part is, as we become um, a manufacturing operation, we shift away from being that exploration company, and then we attract a whole new base of investors and a whole new um, set of eyeballs. So it's obviously a good time to be involved now, just before production gets started. And, I, I think it's a very good investment. I'm invested, Every, um, people I know are invested, so it's, it's something that uh, you can reach out to the company about as well. Ares would like to thank all of its shareholders for their continued support. If you or someone you know can further support Ares in this transitional stage, we urge you to take advantage of the life offering opportunity, which closes July 29, 2024. For more information on the life offering or on how to invest, please contact our team directly. I'd now like to hand over to James Walker, CEO. Hi everyone. So that's, that's not a bad looking video actually. So um, I haven't seen it all the way through. Not, it looks pretty good. Um, so everybody, I, I think I've, um, a lot of people who are already on this are probably shareholders already. So. I've got to walk through this presentation, but um, I won't repeat myself too much because I'm sure you've heard this story a million times. But for those who haven't heard it, I'd, I'll just run uh, through uh, a good overview of, of everything we're working on currently and, and how things are progressing uh, and a bit of background about what we're doing. So, uh, Carl, do you want to flip to the next slide? So, no. All right. <clears throat> so just a bit of background about how we got going on this. Um, Back in, I'd say, about 2019, we were looking for projects that were near to revenue, permitted, didn't need huge amounts of capital expenditure, and uh, we were fairly agnostic on the resource. But um, we saw a, uh, a project, an industrial mineral project that was being done in Utah, where there were two artisanal miners who were just taking product out of the ground, uh, putting it into a bag and selling it. And we thought, well, that's an incredibly unique thing in, uh, in mining at all. Um, we realized that actually meant that the, the purity of the product um, was excellent and um, that if you, if you start with that kind of benchmark to even get it be, um, to a final product that's industrial grade um, and mass manufactured, it's, it would take significantly less processing, which means significantly less capital. So we began pursuing this, this project. And when we got down there, we realized that um, th even though there were these artisanal miners mining this area, um, the whole of the district had become available because um, while it had been mined artisanally in the past across this district, um, a lot of the industry had been shipped overseas or people had retired or people had just died of old age. And so it all became available. So we staked the whole area um, and we, we amalgamated into one big, um, one big mass. 
and then we, we began developing it. Uh, we took it public in uh, January 2023, and then, uh, sorry, 2020. And then we began doing the normal things that you would do, geophysics, drilling, um, plant design, um, LIDAR, um, all of these things that we were building up in exactly a, a good plan of how we proceed with this. And um, uh, and we worked, we were quite strategic. We worked around like the restrictions they put on us because of COVID and there were shipping delays and that sort of thing. But we we bought plants, um, we got a lot of personnel to site, we built, we built the mapping, everything that we needed. And in 2023, um, we closed two big federal and state loans um, that came to us and we bought, went out and bought a 50 acre industrial property um, with buildings that was already permitted as in, um, for industrial use. Um, and then we started buying in sil um, steel uh, and, and starting to erect the plant. And conjointly with that, um, we brought in um, the mining team as well to clear the whole mine site out, buy the big heavy mining equipment in. And so now we've got a lot of heavy machinery up there and um, <clears throat> we built the portal, shock created it, uh, reinforced it. And now we've we've actually got that ramp all the way into hitting ore now. So an update since that video is that we've now hit that ore body and the next stages from there will be um, obviously just going through that and building the ventilation system. But they're, they're ahead of schedule on that. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, how next stages will look is that the um, processing facility, um, it's fabricated, it's delivered to site, um, but uh, we'll begin slotting that into the steel structure uh, and turning it on. And in the next few months, we should start getting product out the door and then we'll begin ramping that up. And um, we should have a, a pretty nice industrial manufacturing operation supplying floor spa to the US industry for the first time. So uh, that's uh, Carl, next slide. <clears throat> so just a little bit about floor spa itself. Um, it's a critical mineral, which means it's um, vital to the economic security of the United States. Um, it's actually uh, regarded as a critical mineral in quite a few countries, Canada included. Um, and the reason why it's it's considered essential to um, the security of the countries is because it's so widely used in industrial and manufacturing processes. So uh, steel, aluminum, hydrofluoric acid, fluorine, but also things like lithium ion batteries, um, electronics, um, nuclear enrichment. These are very obviously very important foundational industries to uh, for any uh, advanced economy. <clears throat> and floor spar is currently the only non-metallic critical mineral that's 100% imported from abroad. Um, and there's a bit of history to that too, because um, the US actually did have a thriving and very decent floor spar industry. But when China was industrializing, um, they flooded the market with cheap produce, and that uh, that largely undermined and destroyed the US market and industry. And they got shipped over overseas. And um, so obviously, now we're looking to bring that industry back and rebuild it and expand it and um, have that domestic source and get off foreign reliance. Um, there are two grades, the principal grades used in industry and these, these do break down further, but in principle, you've got metallurgical grade, which is more widely used in steel, glass, cement industries, things like that. And then you've got the acid grade, which is really classified as any purity of uh, calcium fluoride above 97%. And that's used in aluminum, hydrofluoric acid, fluorine, those sort of uh, electronics, those sort of big industries there too. Um, but again, um, there's been a huge amount of interest in the product that we're producing um, because it is domestic, because it is becoming increasingly difficult to source. Um, and so uh, we can begin fill, um, fulfilling some of that demand. Uh, Carl, next slide. <clears throat> So the global floor spa market has is, is, is become quite interesting because, as I said, um, the U.S. Uh, industry was undermined principally by China industrializing and our cheap product that flooded the market. But um, what's actually happened since then is that as it's expanded, the reserves it had of that easy, mineable, high-grade product have been exhausted. So even China went from becoming a net exporter to net importer. And in terms of things like met metallurgical grade, you, they struggle with that quite significantly. And, and the reason for that is that you can take very low grade floor spar and you can put it flotation systems and you can keep on processing it until you get to that 97%. But pr to produce the metallurgical grade, you need to start with a relatively high grade already. And 
that's actually something we we have at our disposal. It's it's the grade that we have is, is sort of unnaturally high. Um, natural grade, we're getting out the ground in bog samples, that 40, 50%, and that gives us enormous access to the metallurgical market, um, particularly um, because it, it can often happen where the, the demand of that is so great that even though it's the less pure products, it can sometimes be uh, retail for more than the acid spa product. So there's few countries producing this, and there's a massive demand that's growing. And part of that demand is actually growing because of um, mandates like um, the decarbonizing mandates so you're looking at things like um, uh, electric vehicles becoming increasingly pushed lithium-ion batteries need floor spar um, in both the anode the cathode and the electrolyte um, so that's driving a, a huge amount of demand but already um, if you think of terms of refrigeration units air conditioning units um, another area where floor spar features in um, the, the demand for those is growing quite quickly, especially as countries industrialize and people are looking for better quality of life. Um, these units are obviously increasing. And so the demand on floor spars is increasing at the same time when there are fewer countries producing this, especially in significant numbers. Um, and that's really driving up the price, but also driving up uh, the, the, the actual floor spar market, which is in the billions of dollars now. So we'll start off as a small component within the US um, that we'll try and grow out as much as we can, but the market is, could take pretty much whatever we can produce. Carl? <clears throat> so there's some interesting aspects, I think, that um, with regard to the company and in terms of where investors are actually getting involved with us now is that the junior mining market, uh, which is what we're currently in, and we're, we're obviously looking to move out of that as soon as we can, um, that I think that's a very depressed market at the moment. And so you're probably noticing that if you are involved in junior mining stocks, that a lot of the companies have actually been very much undermined and destroyed at the moment. But that's also given people an incredibly opportunistic way to get involved with very good product uh, projects um, at a time when um, you can get them at bargain rates. And I would say for, for some, they can go all the way to where we are, almost to production, where things are very significantly de-risked. So, um, certainly where we are at the moment in a better market, um, things would really take off. And you could, we expect that we'll see that sort of take off as we begin transitioning into that production, into that revenue and into that sort of manufacturing sector. Um, but we already have got to the point where the ramp installations are in place. It's permitted. The plants have already been purchased. It's already been backed by the, the state and by the government at a federal level. Uh, and so we, we have majorly de-risked this project and we've taken it right up until the cusp um, of, that, of that production. Um, <clears throat> in a market that's growing and there's been a, been a lot of um, uh, demand for the product and already um, sales and purchase agreements are being sent to the company. Um, and while we think that um, initially we'll start with aiming to ramp up to 50,000 a year uh, final product, um, what we expect actually is that once we can open up secondary and tertiary mine sites, we can start growing that output even more and begin catering towards the larger industry, especially once that flotation plant arrives online later this year. Um, and we move, start producing the acid spa that the, that's two thirds of the US market. So fluorine, hydrofluoric acid, electronics, aluminum, that, that kind of thing. Um, but we have an enormously professional staff already in place that we've been ramping up. Um, and um, we are also very fortunate that we're in a very mining friendly jurisdiction and a lot of the infrastructure that mines normally struggle with, like roads to actually get there. Um, we got a bit lucky and um, we are just next to the only beryllium mine in the entire country too, whose government, um, so the government has built a massive highway straight to our mine. So that reduces significantly a lot of the costs and the time involved of actually moving uh, product between the mine site and, um, and the processing site. And um, even after the processing site, um, we've got the rail spur built out um, so we can immediately start shipping it around the country. And we've got a, obviously a good relationship with Union Pacific, but also with materials brokers that can help move those things and use their resources to, to move this product around the place. And um, one of those partners, Kramer Contour, is um, even um, putting a forward sale agreement to um, in place with us at the moment, where we're, we're currently sending them samples to get customer buy-off. Um, that will qualify us for an even uh, bigger investment. And then we start producing product for them later this year. And um, 
the the facilities that we've got down there, they should be able to start pushing out that product uh, quite imminently. So I don't want to say when, but uh, obviously we'll announce that as much as we can um, and let everybody know as soon as you get that initial product out the door. So, uh, Carl? <clears throat> so uh, who we are at the moment, um, we, we are a publicly traded company that trades on um, the OTCQX in the US and the Canadian Securities Exchange in uh, Canada. And um, we also trade in Germany uh, on the Frankfurt Exchange. Um, Germans are very big into industrial minerals and industry. And so it's, um, we obviously receive a lot of interest from Europe and that's another way for people to be involved who are over there. Um, we've, uh, I think uh, as we were obviously ramping up our production, we were, the share price was improving. We wanted to obviously just do a, a smaller financing um, to keep the mining engineers working and, and get that wrap completed. Um, and I think that's probably um, been responsible for the share price being somewhat stagnant since um, since that appreciation began. But the good part is typically um, the share price will begin to appreciate as soon as that round is closed again. And that will coincide very nicely with like very being very close to getting that product out the door. And then what we can expect is a lot more market interest and um, hopefully get that momentum back as too. So, um, and the good the good part here as well is that I think we have much longer term ambitions to uplist in the states as well, especially once we hit that revenue and we start qualifying for bigger exchanges that will have that greater volume um, to bring that big um, to bring that greater institutional investment uh, and then bring up that market cap. So it's a very exciting time to be involved in. Obviously, there's a lot of work. Um, but we're, we're in a very nice position now where a lot of the work has been done, it's been de-risked, and now we can look towards long-term growth and growing out the company. So, Carl? <clears throat> um, and uh, just to uh, touch on that uh, alongside it, um, what we're planning here is as we shift towards going from um, junior mining company into a big manufacturing company, um, that'll be... Uh, coordinated again with a big marketing push to raise invest awareness and so far we've done a, a number of things like update the website and we're trying to put out more social media to keep everybody updated and um, databases where we can answer more questions as they come in from different areas so the facebook's the instagrams the um direct messaging and the linkedin posts um and we'll do we'll keep doing these investor meets too because um uh we regularly make a lot of progress and the good part is we it's always quite a positive thing to be able to announce what we're doing uh, and so we'll obviously keep up that drive and just keep everybody updated but um, we want to be as transparent as possible and i think there's some real advantages to doing that and um, part of the part of the marketing strategy will involve that communication as well so, <clears throat> so um, this is just a very high level of the management team i think it's an excellent team um, people I would want to touch on um, as being fairly significant in this is that um, Bob Lee, one of our directors, they already run um, several floor spa mines in uh, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia. So a lot of the expertise we managed to siphon off, we actually pinched directly from them and we even were shipping um, several tons of product out to Thailand where we were running it through mills so we could optimize design because it was quite interesting when we started wanting to build out a, a big commercial floor spa operation there were no experts in floor spa um, that we could get hold of and um, for, for plant design and things like that it was better to reach out to people who are actually manufacturing uh, and bob unfortunately helped us design a lot of the plant equipment the installation of it and how we process this thing as well as actually bringing to us to us um, big customer bases and giving us an insight into the market prices and that sort of thing, which is really invaluable because they're already an existing seller. Um, Paul Sargent, um, I think he's got about 30 years or something like that of, of exploration, but he also has a lot of experience with scaling companies and building up and, build, and building competent um, producing as, um, um, uh, assets. Um, and so he's been key instrument in, in the development of the company, taking it from um, exploration through all of those initial stages of exploration all the way up to where we are now which is currently going into production and um but that exploration will likely continue we've we've identified other mine sites that we want to develop immediately after this one when we're, we're revenue positive and we're obviously putting in the permits for those too 
and he's doing that as well in in, in partnership with uh, Raoul Sanabria. And I mentioned there was a deficiency with regard expertise in the um, area of floor spa. Raoul fortunately worked at Europe's largest floor spa mine, um, the Minerva project, I think it was Minerva project uh, in Spain. And so he brought a lot of that expertise straight over and <clears throat> a lot of the deposit types, which are fairly unusual with um, our deposit in Utah. <clears throat> they were things where he had a bit more expertise and could actually hone a lot of what we were doing. So we were very fortunate actually to be able to assemble this team and put everyone together. And so, um, Carl, is there any other slides after this one? Nope. There's a thank you from from me. Um, hopefully that was not, wasn't too long, but um, obviously happy to answer any questions uh, from the, that have come in since. So, yeah, thanks. So just to thank everybody for their questions so far, and if they want to continue, uh, even if we can't answer questions today, they will be um, responded to in short order. So please feel free to ask anything that you would like. Um, so James, for many of us, we've, we've been here with Aries from the beginning of the project, I think so four or five years. <clears throat> what an exciting time to watch the um, mine going into production. How does that make you feel? Uh, on just to, to be able to go from, from where you were to where we are now, that must, be, must give you some really good feelings. Well, relief, I think, is a big one because, um, you know, I think everything was going so well in 2020 and then obviously COVID hit, then there were shipping delays, then then um, thing, even things like the USDA financing and things like that, they, they essentially shut down as an organization and a lot of our strategic planning, which looked very clever in 2020, um, didn't look so clever when we were just sitting around waiting for those financings to close so we could buy that industrial land, ship equipment there. So... It'll be a big relief. It'll be obviously wonderful to see. It's it's actually even now very nice to be able to be at site and walk down 600 feet of that big dugout, uh, exactly the, the picture that's in front of me now, that, that big dugout uh, portal um, and see it all shot created and put in there and the big heavy mining equipment that's delivered to site. So it now looks very real. Um, so that even, even that by itself is very nice to see. But yeah, I think um, relief, but also, um, it, it, there'll be a new, a new wave of, I think, of enthusiasm as we begin to optimize the operation, optimize the plants, try and build up that uh, that production, uh, bring on bring new mining sites onto uh, into development as well alongside the lost sheep area. Um, so yeah, there's I would say it's a very nice time to be involved with this project. Probably the nicest time of the whole last of the four years. So. Thanks, James. Uh, one of the questions we received is asking about Enyo uh, and what are the plans for it to start trading? So um, with Enyo, um, what we wanted to do there is that um, uh, we didn't want it to um, uh, raise money in Enyo, uh, raise money for projects that um, within areas that would dilute the share structure for area strategic mining. And so if we raise for things like the Vanadium project as an example, um, that would have obviously a negative effect. So we spun that out, obviously, to create Enyo um, with the intention of actually beginning the raises on that company originally. Um, so the, the trading of Enyo won't actually start until we begin operations there. Um, because we're trying to run a very tight ship with as few people as possible and, and, and keep expenditures right down because so to reduce the risk to the Aries project, um, we haven't allocated any staff from Aries to work on the Enyo project yet. But once we begin to get into that revenue and we can scale up, um, we can begin allocating resources to Enyo so it can actually start operations. So it's kind of frustrating because we wanted to obviously do them concurrently, but it's still not very sensible. Um, it is, it, when Aries is obviously revenue producing, it becomes um, a big asset in Enyo's corner. So existing Aries shareholders got that stock, that stock will become tradable as soon as Enyo goes into operation, which will coincide very nearly with um, the ramp up in production of, of Aries once it's producing and it's beginning to optimize. Um, so it will it, those stocks will become worth something uh, as soon as we can allocate personnel appropriately. So. Thanks, James. Uh, one of the other questions here is uh, here you're going to be at the flooring um, convention in this October. Uh, I think it was on LinkedIn that you're going to be a guest speaker. So maybe tell us a little bit about that, that experience. <clears throat> Uh, sure. So that's that's actually going to be in Mongolia. Um, funnily enough, when I agreed to do that conference, I thought it was by Zoom or by 
thrown in. So I, I agreed to that conference, not realizing that I'd have to go to Mongolia. So I'm off to Mongolia in October. Um, but we'll be doing some um, keynote speaking addresses to the larger floor spar industry. But it's essentially a collection of um, experts and industry professionals involved in this area. It's, it's fairly specialist and they hold it every single year. Um, there's, a, there's obviously enormous interest in Aries <clears throat> at this summit this time around because it will be the only mine of its kind in the US. And it is, it's quite rare that some of these projects come online. Um, even I think recently, um, Sep Flora down in South Africa, they were a big one that came online, but still a, a significant amount of time ago. Um, and I think um, projects in um, Canada are now receiving a substantial amount of investment to, to obviously kick things off there. But this is kind of a unique situation. So um, obviously we're gonna go there and talk a lot about what we're doing here and um, advertise the company. Um, and obviously if, um, if I can record anything and, and uh, upload it, I will. Um, I think that'll probably be the intention of the marketing department, but um, yeah, it, it, it should be a very good way to get the company's name out there, talk about it, but also bring in a lot of industry professionals and big players in the floor spa market too that might be interested in a US expansion um, as well. So we'll see how it pans out. So. Thanks. I'm thinking about uh, near production uh, with railway spur. Is it all in order or is more to be done to get that real uh, to start? So actually, we've done all the renovation on that work, and it's actually signed off by Union Pacific. We, we paid an external contractor to do all the work. So actually, there's no reason why a rail car couldn't pull up the day and we could just start putting things in there. Um, what, I, what I would say is that um, we maybe we'll build sort of a, a bit more of a, um, a tailored loading bay, but that's a, very, that's a fairly simple week-long project. Um, the other aspect to it too is that some of the partners that we'll be working with will take ownership of that product once it's loaded onto that rail car. So when you get instances like this, sometimes you have to have personnel from that uh, brokerage house or customer actually located in Delta to make sure it goes on site, that it meets the assay requirements. So there could be an office that they want to set up there at the site. We have enough land for them to do it there. Um, but essentially, we it's, it is renovated, it is done. It could be loading today. Um, so that aspect to it is um, is completed. Then any additional work that needs to be done is is largely superficial. So. Uh, and then sticking with that, um, as far as development, a uh, question about flotation plant. Has that arrived yet? What kind of where are we in the the, the flotation? So it's not arrived yet, but the actually some of the major components that have finished the fabrication. What we're doing now is that we're going to get everything done, including the steel, in one go. Um, so we can ship it all in, in, in one go. Um, now, the, tar the tariffs on some of these things have changed quite a bit. So there was a bit of a, an estimation about whether we manufacture the steel in Asia or we manufacture it here and ship it. Um, but I think we've, we've solidified those decisions now. But we want to package up that steel and the plant all together and ship it in one. Most of the plant is now fabricated and it's being boxed, ready to ship in ISO containers. Um, and we'll, we'll obviously bundle that all off and we'll arrive on, on one go. It's going to be pretty significant. There's quite a lot of equipment that's going to be there. And um, we're going to be looking at 15, 16 containers of just, just equipment that's going to then be assembled. But the, the good part is that the construction crew that laid all that concrete, that's putting up that steel, that's slotting in um, the lumps plant equipment can just directly move over to the flotation plant and then start on that initial work to lay the foundations for those devices there. Um, so not arrived on site, but it's imminent. So we, we expect to, I expect to actually try and get those, um, uh, that plant on site by late Q3. So. Fantastic. Um, a while back, the county made an announcement about a find of rare earths. How has that uh, progressed? Um, so, that, so that's quite interesting because um, that generated an enormous amount of interest from the national labs that have a mandate to explore um developing domestic supplies of these these rare earths and they actually took some of our samples from site and they ran their own tests and confirmed that um the the, the one that the, the mineral they were specifically after gallium um uh, was obviously exhibited there and exhibited in interesting enough areas so the the national lab that i'm working with now with in, in partnership with areas they're waiting for some funding opportunities to come through from the department of energy to develop um 
looking at reprocessing some waste product that would contain that gallium uh, and then siphon off it could be a potential secondary line of income for the company too but that also um it also uh, garnered a lot of uh, interest from um uh, research universities research institutions that also want to be involved so there's a number of um universities that are also looking at partnerships with us to develop those other critical minerals. Um, and these are the reason why there's particular interest in these things is that um, they have they have, it, have applications within electronics and um, uh, microchips. And to have that domestic supply is obviously very important and there's money coming out of that. So that could be a very significant area of interest in the future. Um, what I would say is that um, it actually led to some very interesting conversations where those those groups and institutions put us in touch with um, professionals that were actually looking at um, DOD involvement in the critical uh, critical mineral supply chain too. And so some discussions have actually begun around those two and, and areas will actually be submitting some grant applications um, to develop um, that domestic supply chain alongside that DOE, DOD funding opportunities that are currently being released for for, the, for these type of projects, these critical mineral um, rare earth sort of projects that are coming out at the moment. So it's a it's a big, I think it's a big domestic concern and especially for uh, organizations like the DOD, they want to have that domestic supply chain in, in place to ensure the viability of their own their own operations. Um, so it, it could it could transpire that we we directly benefit from those initiatives. Um, but that's something that also came out that was very positive out of that um national lab exploration of our gallium that we we found within our ore thanks james uh, can you say how many companies are interested in purchasing our ore and uh, are there any orders there already and to add to that as well what are the current market prices for ore uh, so there's been a number of companies that have directly reached out to us so um some I don't mind announcing that because they've been publicly released, like Kramer Erz Contour that visited the site. Um, they they are they they are principally interested initially in metallurgical grade for the steel industry. They could they could easily um, take as much as we can possibly produce because the demand is obviously that high. If you think um, a ton of steel uses twenty pounds of floor spar and the U.S. produces eighty million tons a year. It gives you an idea that like how how much is just that one industry requires of this product uh, and currently they have to source that from abroad um there's been some big chemical uh manufacturers as well obviously i think if i if i named them everyone would know who they were um that are making some um visits to site soon to, to do some preliminary investigations of what we're actually doing down there now they could they're obviously their principal interest would be that um, acid spa product um, and um, it could it, they could be a, again a, another joint partner that could come in um, they would be looking to obviously manufacture things like hydrofluoric acid but they would be doing that at their facility again that's a huge market that would easily eat up everything we can produce but as we open up those secondary tertiary mine sites we can begin to cater to more of the wider industry um, so I, while I can't name anything because it's a public company and I, it has to be publicly released um, significant interest from US domestic industry, um, particularly steel and chemical so far. Um, but um, it'd be interesting as well to see um, even the even the electric battery manufacturers, if they want, if they do want to de-risk a lot of the supply chain, a lot of these um, rare earth minerals, these um, floor spa will have to come from abroad for them. They may really just want to have that domestic supply and come in and get involved and, and buy it from us directly. So uh, some conversations like that have actually started, um, but we'll see how they, they progress as we as we begin to build up that operation, begin to build up that production. And thinking a little bit ahead to the future, are there still plans in place to expand to Illinois and Kentucky? And if so, what stage are we at with that? So the, they actually, Illinois and Kentucky used to be the largest producing area of the United States. And when I mentioned earlier about the U.S. industry being essentially wrecked by that cheap Chinese product that flooded the market, that actually doesn't exist anymore. But um, that th those were the principal areas that were hit. And so that industry shut down in those areas. But it only shut down because of cheap product that flooded the market that doesn't exist anymore. So bringing those things back online 
um, is something we're uniquely positioned to do because we now have the expertise. We've already, we've already been involved in floor spa. We know how to manufacture these plants, where to get them from. And a lot of the um, personnel we got involved in the company already, we can directly bring them over into these operations. So 100%, and I've already, um, uh, I've already spoken to some of the mining teams about this, that I want to, I, I want to identify the, e, the low-hanging fruit, um, uh, fruit on these targets in Kentucky, Illinois, that area. And once areas is comfortably operating in Utah, expand over there and begin building these things out because that is potentially um, even larger uh, operation than Utah could be, uh, especially given its history. Um, and obviously we'll flesh that out and confirm all of that, but um, it's very, if we can bring that whole industry back online there, then maybe the US could go for a net importer and a net exporter too, because the rest of the world is obviously dying for this stuff. Um, we can begin producing a lot of this. I think it, it could even have it in um, a, an inflationary reducing effect because um, take for instance steel as an example like the cost of steel is almost tripled i think in a few years but that's mostly component um re uh, responsibility because of component um increases in costs if you start bringing down those costs and they can have a trickle down effect to cheaper steel and things like that um so there's all sorts of national benefits that could come transpire out of just building back that domestic industry things that should have never really been shipped overseas or or, or destroyed in the first place but it's you know time can hopefully correct these things and, and bring these things back online so no yeah during the video you mentioned a gap in funding um what potential risks could come from from not raising enough capital so what, what i would say is now that we've obviously that ramp insulation is pretty much completed now um but that got us into the first bit of war that, that of sort of um what we would want to do is we just need to install the ventilation system within that ramp system. Um, once that's done, we can actually then start on an industrial scale removing that product. Um, so that's a big aim that we want to do. We, the current financing has gone a long way. It's actually got that ramp to actually hit that ore body. Now it just needs to push through, build that ventilation system, and that's it. Now we've got product, and now it's ready for the plant. Um, so obviously, the funding, um, the funding that we've done so far, and for everybody that's actually been involved in that, um, you've been terrific because that's that's completed that ramp insulation and got us there. The, the the additional bit of funding we need is just to get that ventilation system in, get that product to the processing site, um, complete that that plant. Actually, the plant does not need a huge amount of investment now, um, but it's that small funding gap. And actually, the the good part is that because there is a forward sale here, even once we start with that low level of production from that initial ore, we qualify for that a uh, couple million dollars, that can complete everything else. And then we we've, we were in production, we're self-sustaining, we're revenue generating. So that's what we look, that's why we opened up this financing, just to make sure that we had the resources because the worst scenario would be, we're on the cusp, we've got all the heavy equipment, we've got all the plants and the industrial estates and the mines um, here or, and we uh, and we we just had to ramp down to a point where we couldn't just do that last um, two three percent of what we needed to do to to get that thing into production. So that that's what the the raise was about. And, and thinking about that raise and the life offering uh, is that close to the closing. And then in addition to that, for U.S. investors that are interested in getting involved, is there an opportunity for them? Because you know the life is only available to Canadians. No, actually, I, I, we've had a, we've had Americans invest in that life offering already, so it's 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 open. You would just do it directly through the company if you don't want to do it through a brokerage house. But I would just encourage you to reach out to us directly. Um, we'll um, we'll do it. Uh, we'll arrange the sub agreements and all that kind of thing. Um, but uh, it does close at the at the end of this month. I think sometime around about twenty something of July. Um, so we've got a few weeks left on it. Three weeks left on it. Something like that. Um, before we have to begin starting to close it so it's it's still open but um it's and we've got a, a margin to bring enough people in the good part is we, we're so close now that um even if it's just a little bit that just gets us into that few samples qualify for that forward sale then that de-risks the rest of the rest of the operation so Perfect. there's been a few questions as well about uh, nuclear nano and your relationship with them and how you see that that relationship could benefit areas in the future 
And also a question yeah. about how, how you would manage your time between nuclear nano and, and Aries. Okay. Well, the, the most significant thing there is that as we build this company up, the best thing about that connection is that it gives us an access to a, um, connections that we never would have ordinarily had. Because, um, for instance, like if we want to take the company onto NASDAQ, and I do, and I do want to uplift Aries too, we now have the bankers, the connections, the NASDAQ connections that can do that kind of thing, the people who can get that sort of thing done and, and do it um, do it properly and do it efficiently and do it cheap, inexpensively. Now, those are sort of things that we would never ordinarily as a junior mining market not have had access to. But the people who can realize those things, we now have that firepower because of those connections to bring in and, and push this out. The other thing I would say as well is that it's, it's opened up once we're actually revenue generating much greater access to institutional investment because um, that's a very well connected company with very high level people um, that Aries can directly benefit from. So it's it, it's it should actually be in the long run um, enormously advantageous. Um, and um, with regards to spending my time, um, I mean. I <laughs> uh, I just work all the time anyway. Like it's there's been no actual conflict at all. To be honest, I, I think um, I'm not comparing myself to these people. But if you look at anyone like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or anyone like that, the people who actually everyone's heard of. I mean, they they run five, six, seven, eight companies, and they they do it all. The the most important thing is to have the right team because even with the mining, I'm a mining engineer by background, but I defer to experts. And um, the geology, I defer, to, I defer to experts. Processing, I defer to experts. And when you're working in, in a team, it's the people who micromanage that have no time. Um, you can, you can oper obviously operate very effectively if you have the right people in place. It's nice to, sorry, that leads nice to another question that we have that talks about the correlation we have with other industries and how the US government has been so involved recently in developing nuclear applications. And that leads to another question, which I think you can you can tie together because we're running out of time, about the correlation between another um, emerging market in the U.S., which is AI technology. So maybe you could comment a little bit on, on those industries and, and the correlations that we have with them. So there's there might be a three pronged approach here because um, the the tech industry to manufacture electronics and microchips and all those kind of things they need high grade floor spa to be able to manufacture those just as a base level. Um, and they're expanding incredibly quickly, mostly because of AI. And the AI, the, the thing is with AI is that um, even if you think about a human brain, is you, if you add a neuron to a human brain, it's not just making it a neuron more complicated. It's all the connections that every existing neuron has to make. And AI is, works in a very similar kind of way. So the power requirement becomes quite exponential with AI. And they, they're already estimating some crazy figures with regard power that they'll need. Um, to power these installations, but that that also has a, a knock-on effect of where they're going to get this power from. So obviously floor spar is a big component of uranium hexafluoride, which is used in uranium enrichment, and the AI tech centers are actually looking at nuclear now as being able, having to power their installations because they need a power source that can power their, ins their installations wherever they want to put them. And nuclear is kind of unique in that way. That's one aspect to it, but the other is Floor spa will actually be necessary for the manufacture of microchips and electronics that they need to build out these things. So there's a big push in this area. It's one, going to need a lot of chips. Two, is going to need a lot of energy. And obviously, we're going to be big beneficiaries of that kind of thing uh, on both fronts. Um, so uh, terrific. Like uh, some of the some of the power requirements they, they're actually putting out there look insane. Um, but for the power that they want to output in terms of the sophistication of their software, uh, it's, an, it's either necessary or they stagnate forever. So, I, I, and I don't see them stagnating. So we'll obviously benefit from that big drive in that sector too. So. And then just this will be our last question. Um, so thinking about it being an election year in the US and how tightly uh, Aries is, is linked to the uh, government, how do you see this election year going for the company? Do you think it, it, there'll be a big difference in, in um, business plans? And then also, what are you doing for the 4th of July? 
working. <laughs> I work all the time. I work. I work every day. Um, I barely see my own kids. So, um, so with regard to the election, um, to be honest, when uh, when I was involved in the mining industry from that 2016 to 2020 period, it was actually a really wonderful time to be involved in the mining industry because a lot of regulations were stripped up, stripped out, and actually to to make big uh, advances uh, at the time the the regulatory framework was sort of refitted to make um, commercial projects a lot more viable. Um, I don't know if, say, there, say Trump wins um, and we shift um, over to a new administration. Uh, if he if he brings back those kind of initiatives, that's terrific. But the thing is, though, that it, even if even if it stays a Democrat government uh, into the next elect, um, after the next election. Um, there's a lot of critical mineral funds that we already directly developed from. So whatever happens with the administration, it actually doesn't matter. The U.S. needs um, certain domestic supply chains itself, and there's the funding exists for those things. So whether we go back to that easier deployment of commercial um, entities that we saw back in 2016, 2020, or the, the funding of um, critical minerals and the building back of supply chains that the current administration is obviously investing in. We win both ways, so I don't want to say it doesn't matter to us. Um, but like it doesn't. It, it, either way it goes, we benefit from whatever initiatives both the governments are, are doing it because there's it's bipartisan building up the states and building up those um, that domestic industry. So we'll see what happens in November or December, whatever it is. Um, but like uh, should be an interesting election year. But I'm not going to. Uh, if you're asking me if I should call well, who's going to win, I'm I'm not going to go that far. So. <laughs> no, thanks, James. So that, that kind of wraps things up. So anybody who didn't get their question answered uh, will be responded to shortly. All right, terrific. And look, um, uh, from my point of view, everyone, thanks very much for jumping on. Um, I quite like doing these things. They're, they're always very positive, and uh, it's very nice to be able to relay good news, um, especially as we get closer and closer and closer. Um, so yeah, send out any questions anytime and I'll keep everyone updated with um, progress, uh, especially as we, we, we start um, uh, completing those final steps. Okay, Mark, I think that's back to you just to... Okay. Oh, we've got a countdown, so yeah. There we go. But yeah, thanks everybody for jumping on and yeah, reach out anytime. Happy to answer.